Hi there, welcome audience. We're going to talk about the pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy. And I'm Sharon Adler. I'm a nephrologist and investigator at the Lundquist Research Institute at Harbor UCLA Medical Center and professor of medicine at the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Welcome. Here are my financial disclosures. So our learning objective today is quite simple. We're going to discuss the core elements of the four hit hypothesis that underlies the pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy. So IgA nephropathy actually uh, comes in three flavors. It's diagnosed by kidney biopsy. And what you can see here is a glomerulus with some mesangial expansion and hypercellularity. And on immunofluorescence microscopy, the main uh, immunoglobulin that's deposited is IgA. And you can see immune complexes on electron microscopy in um, the mesangium. So we're going to be talking about primary IgA nephropathy, which is also called Berger's disease. And just for completion, you should know that there are secondary forms of IgA nephropathy associated with paraproteins if they are present, or infections sometimes, or with viral diseases like HIV or hepatitis, or inflammatory bowel disease, cirrhosis, HLA-B27 spondyloarthropathies, and psoriasis. And we're not going to be discussing any of those secondary causes. And finally, IgA can come in a vasculitic form, which we designate Enoch Schirmlein purpose. Purpura. So we will not be discussing secondary or vasculitic, and we're going to focus on primary IgA nephropathy. Primary IgA nephropathy was first reported by um, French investigators Berger and Inglay in a paper written in the Journal of Urology and Nephrology in 1968. And it was described as a relatively benign condition seen in children who have microscopic or sometimes macroscopic hematuria, who also on renal biopsy had mesangial IgA deposits. But now we know that the outcomes are not necessarily benign and they correlate with time average proteinuria. So this is data from uh, Toronto showing that in patients who um, in the red line have less than 300 milligrams of proteinuria a day, the 15-year outcome is pretty good, with only about 5% of patients with this small amount of proteinuria reaching end-stage renal disease. But as proteinuria increases in patients from to one gram or two grams or three grams or more than three grams, one can see a progressive decline in the good outcomes and an increase in bad outcomes. So there's an incremental increase of proteinuria by uh, more in patients who have more than one gram of proteinuria per day, and kidney function can decline in these patients with increased proteinuria by more than 10 to 25 times faster than our good outcome group, less than 300 milligrams of proteinuria a day. So IgA nephropathy is the most common primary glomerulonephritis in the world, and it has varied clinical presentations. Patients can remain asymptomatic for their entire life, but others present with microscopic hematuria or hematuria that occurs concomitant with a sore throat. That's called synpharyngitic hematuria, and often this is a trigger for an evaluation and a diagnosis. Very few patients are nephrotic, less than 15%, but most are non-nephrotic, as we've seen in the previous slide. Patients can also present with either acute or rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. Clinical risk factors for IgA nephropathy are very well recognized. Heavy proteinuria, now defined by most as more than 500 milligrams a day, although some stick to the 750 or 1,000 milligram per day threshold. 
Uncontrolled hypertension is a bad prognostic indicator, low GFR at presentation, older age at onset, and familiality, especially certain genotypes. We now know that there are also morphological risk factors for IgA nephropathy, and our pathology colleagues have given us the MEST-C categorization of IgA nephropathy, where mesangial hypercellularity is scored, that's the M, endocapillary hypercellularity is scored, that's the E, segmental sclerosis is scored, that's the S, tubulo atrophy and interstitial fibrosis is scored, that's the T, and cellular crescence, either fibrocellular or cellular, is also scored. And when you add the clinical risk factors with the MEST-C score, um, the two are additive in an ability to predict outcome. So let's turn to pathogenesis. For a long, long time, exogenous antigens were sought to explain why patients got IgA nephropathy. And searches for exogenous antigens were really um, uh, failures. The new IgA nephropathy is an autoimmune disease in which the patient's own endogenous under galactosylated IgA1 becomes an autoantigen. So you say galactose. I don't know anything about galactose. What's galactose? You actually know galactose. On the left is glucose and it's a six carbon molecule with hydrogens and hydroxyl ions hanging off the carbons. And on the right is galactose. And the only difference between glucose and galactose is that the fourth carbon position, the hydrogen ion and the hydroxyl ion are flipped. <clears throat> They're mirror images. So you know galactose, it's an epimer of glucose. And that's why sometimes you'll see this described incorrectly as underglycosylated. It's really underglactosylated. So the antigen is actually endogenous and it's poorly galactosylated or undergalactosylated IgA1. And antibodies develop to it and the antibodies can be IgA antibodies or IgG antibodies directed against galactosylated, undergalactosylated IgA1. So in this new IgA nephropathy, mucosally primed B cells, here the gut lumen Peyer's patches, miss traffic to bone marrow and support the secretion of undergalactosylated polymeric IgA1 antigen into the circulation where it stimulates antibody production, resulting in circulating immune complexes that then end up in the mesangium and cause an inflammatory response. So this has become known as the four hit hypothesis. It starts with aberrant undergalactosylated IgA1, and this, the presence of this is insufficient by itself to produce IgA nephropathy. The antibody synthesized against this undergalactosylated IgA1 then forms circulating immune complexes, that's uh, HIT2 and HIT3, and then once these deposit in the mesangium, which is HIT4, it causes mesangial hypercellularity, local inflammation, and glomerular damage, resulting in many in progressive kidney disease. So who should get treated with IgA nephropathy and how should we treat? So I'm going to answer that by talking to you about two patients and they are identical except for the amount of proteinuria that they have. Patient one is a 35 year old Hispanic man he has IgA nephropathy diagnosed by biopsy, and our pathology colleagues have scored his MEST-C scoring. He has M1 mesangial hypercellularity, no endocapillary proliferation, 
some segmental sclerosis, some tubulointerstitial atrophy and fibrosis. On immunofluorescence, he has mesangial IgA and C3 staining. And on electron microscopy, he has the expected immune deposits confined to the mesangium with 60% podocyte effacement. At the time of biopsy, he had persistent proteinuria of 250 milligrams per 24 hours, even though he's been on an ACE inhibitor for six months. He's not taking any other medications. His blood pressure is well controlled at 120 over 70. His physical exam is completely normal. On laboratory examination, his serum creatinine is 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. His EGFR is 60. And his urinalysis shows one plus blood, one plus protein, 10 to 15 red cells per high power field, no significant white cells and no casts. On renal ultrasound, his left kidney is 11 centimeters, right 10.5, and both have mild increased echogenicity. Patient two is exactly the same, except that at the time of biopsy, he had persistent proteinuria of 900 milligrams, despite his ACE, ACE inhibitor. And he also is not taking other medicines. So patient one, 250 milligrams of proteinuria a day, patient two, 900 milligrams of proteinuria per day. The urinalysis is the same, except this patient, patient two, shows three plus proteinuria instead of one plus proteinuria. And I kind of figure you don't think that makes much of a difference, do you? So let's see if it does. We're going to look at a risk assessment tool. We know already that there are clinical risk assessors and there are morphologic risk assessors, and we've discussed those. But now we have a way to take these two and create a composite risk assessment called the International IgA Nephropathy Prediction Tool. The prediction tool now has two versions of it, one that can be ascertained for risk at biopsy and the other that can be ascertained risk one to two years after biopsy. Both use the same uh, um, elements to predict risk. They use systolic and diastolic blood pressure, the GFR, amount of proteinuria, age, race, whether or not the patient is on RAS inhibition, whether or not the patient is on immunosuppression, and each score for MESH separately to quantify risk. And you recall that our patients are exactly the same except for the amount of proteinuria, 250 milligrams versus 900 milligrams a day. So we're going to look at the risk of a 50% EGFR decline or end-stage renal disease at five years in patient one who has 250 milligrams of proteinuria per day. And your choices are the risk is 1%, 11%, 21%, 31%, or 41%. And I would like you to think about what you think the risk is in this patient who's on RAS inhibition and has 250 milligrams per day of residual risk. Okay, so if we use the tool, the calculator tells us that that risk is 11%, which is a bit higher than I might have guessed had I not um, gone to the prediction tool. And now let's look at the risk of our patient who has 900 milligrams of proteinuria per day. Obviously, the choices are 1, 11, 21, 31, and 41 percent. Clearly, it's going to be more than 1 or 11 percent. Think about what you think the risk is likely to be. So it turns out that the risk of um, having 900 milligrams of proteinuria compared to 250 milligrams of proteinuria almost doubles the risk of a 50 percent EGFR decline or end-stage renal disease at five years, which is quite a big deal if you were thinking initially that the, the difference between 250 and 900 milligrams of proteinuria 
was not a big deal. So now, if we think about the National Kidney Foundation um, paradigm for classifying patients according to their GFR and their albuminuria, patient uh, two is here, this unhappy guy in purple, because he has a mild decrease in his uh, GFR and more than 300 milligrams of proteinuria per day. But the good news is that if we use regression tools to reduce his proteinuria, we can reduce his risk. And that's what IgA nephropathy treatment is completely about these days. Now, KDIGO 2021 provides a management algorithm that is actually happily already out of date and under revision. The rationale for it still exists. If you have a low risk patient, we employ supportive care. The thing that makes this out of risk is that we, out of um, date, is that we have better supportive care tools. We have SGLT2 inhibitors and we have sparsentin, which are supportive care elements that were not available in 2021. If we have high risk patients, Again, the rationale is that high-risk patients should get supportive care and immunosuppression. But happily, again, we have targeted re release budesonide, which was not available in 2021. And we have new data regarding the efficacy and safety of uh, orally prescribed and completely absorbed prednisone. So this is under revision, but the rationale is the same. Low-risk patients, supportive care. High-risk patients, more than that. So um, I've taken you through the uh, rationale of linking pathogenesis to an approach to treatment. And there are additional readings and resources that um, you may wish to consult as you think about IgA nephropathy, its pathogenesis, and its treatment. Thank you for joining us.